You're listening to Today at Museum of the Bible. These exclusive conversations with authors, scholars, and specialists visiting the museum focus on how they are currently engaging with the Bible in their lives and work. Welcome to Today at Museum of the Bible. I'm Charlotte Clay. And I'm Jeff Cloa. And today we are joined by two special guests, Dr. Modi Aviam and Dr. Stephen Notley. Dr. Aviam is professor at Kinneret College in Galilee and the head archaeologist of the El Araj excavation. Dr. Notley is the academic director of the El Araj excavation, and he was a founding chair of the New Testament Studies program at Jerusalem University College. Thank you both for being with us. Happy to be here. Yeah. And welcome back. This is what third time? Third time. Third yes, year? yes, yeah. by so, popular demand. And uh, back. <laughs> back in DC in January for the annual update uh, lecture tonight on the excavations, and uh, you keep finding really cool stuff. It's amazing. Um, so why don't we start off with just for people who aren't familiar with your project, what's a quick summary of where you are and what you're looking for or what you're finding? Yeah, we. We started in 2016 excavating uh, with an idea, a hope, to find evidence for a first century Jewish fishing village uh, known in the New Testament as Bethsaida. Um, I, up until then, we would have argued that it hadn't been located. It's sort of, mm -hmm. I like to call it the last lost city of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And um, we began in 2016 and have excavated seven seasons. Um, going down through various layers, Crusader, Byzantine, and then down to the Roman level, which would be uh, reaching to the New Testament mm -hmm. level of New Testament period, and uh, finding various uh, artifacts, pottery, glass, coins, uh, things there, and An entire well, buildings, and then a whole, and the, <laughs> I think a surprise yeah. uh, for all of us was uh, finding a basilica that a legendary basilica that people thought didn't exist mm -hmm. or thought was confused. They, they yeah. thought that uh, pilgrims had confused it with the church in Capernaum. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, it's quite a large, uh, substantial uh, basilica there at, at El Araj. Yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. Good. And what does that church find mean for the site, like in terms of the archaeological significance? It's, it points right to it being possibly the city of Bethsaida. I, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, um, the fact that there is a church and a monastery that goes very well with evidence of uh, uh, Bishop Willibald, who was uh, made his pilgrimage in the 8th century, and mentions a church, a basilica, at the site called Bethsaida, which was built over the house of Peter and Andrew, mm. tells us as archaeologists that in the Byzantine period, People identify the place as Bethsaida, the name is still there, yeah. and there is still a memory of Peter and Andrew in the Byzantine period. There's a difference of a few hundred years mm -hmm. since they lived there, if this is the place, and, and the, the build of the church. But they identified the places. That's a, that's a, uh, almost a smoking gun yeah. for the identification. Yeah. And the fact that below it, we have Roman period structures uh, connecting it and, and building the the story that, 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 that this site of El Araj is the best candidate to identify Bethsaida. Mm. Mm. Amazing. And, and this year you found, uh, I don't know if you're quite expecting to find something underneath the altar area of the church, right? So what do you think that is? The, um, as we know from every other uh, Byzantine period church and up until today, of course, is that as the apse is the focus of the of the card being made at the church, um, it, it is the most sacred place, and usually the uh, the, the object that secures the building. Uh, sometimes it's a reliquarium, sometimes something else mm -hmm. uh, should be there. And uh, therefore, and, and when we started excavating the the apse uh, and the mosaic was partly missing, we realized that there are some walls underneath. So the archaeological idea is to check it in a scientific way. Mm -hmm. We don't dig from the side. We have to take out the mosaic floor from above. We did it with our conservator, Yesh Dre, uh, who took it away. And we started digging from the top. There was a very specific fill of soil in it. And we got into a 
piece of a wall of about uh, um, 10 feet long or a little bit more which was surrounded by another wall hmm. below it to the side we reached down to the first century so we can clearly say that we have under the church we have houses from the first century from the early roman period at the time of the new testament it continued to the second third century grew up and sometimes in the fourth century a structure was built separating a piece of a wall uh, from the other elements surrounding it in a room and there's other walls from the fourth century that continue that we're going to check next season and when the church was built the apse the center of the apse is right above this wall wow so for me as as an archaeologist who excavated like uh, 15 byzantine churches mm -hmm. in the galilee yeah. it is very clear this is the sacred object mm -hmm. uh, yeah. therefore we can say that probably the people who built the church knew already this is a sacred object from the fourth century and decided to build a bigger church above it and mm -hmm. it is under the the, the apse hmm. this is a very similar situation to what we have at capernaum, capernaum right yeah. exactly the same there is a first century house that was developed into the second and third century in the fourth century someone came and said this is the house of of, of peter mm -hmm. and in the fifth century a church was built above it yeah yeah exactly the same and you wow. can see that today yeah so yeah. you're finding the same and it's actually the same style of architecture from the fourth same century style. Right? So, I, I went inside yeah. by permission of the franciscans i went under the modern church of peter uh, to see to to touch the walls to see to look at the the materials the stones the mortar in between it is very similar to our uh, yeah. site it's it's probably i think that in, in next two or three seasons we will be able to say that this is a project that oh. was made uh, uh, in the fourth fifth sixth century to create here these two or three sites yeah. similar similar things is happening at uh at Tabga. oh yeah yeah right. so so okay. there is a project in the northern part part of the sea of galilee hmm. yeah there's a there's a church father called uh, Epiphanius, and he speaks of a um, of Joseph of Tiberius, who requested in the fourth century requested uh, from Constantine to be allowed to build churches, hmm. and he speaks of a series of churches that are built. He talks about Tiberius, uh, Sepphoris, which he calls mm -hmm. Dia Caesarea, yeah. Capernaum, and my sense of as an historian my sense is that what we're getting in that little snippet is we're seeing a whole program of, of building of churches hmm. uh in the galilee that are associated with the ministry of jesus and that topka capernaum yeah. and bethsaida are part of that program wow uh, even though bethsaida doesn't get mentioned he talks about he talks about capernaum and other and other cities oh, yeah. mm. so there are okay. other places and they all come out of the same period in the mm -hmm. fourth century um, and so it's, it's a very interesting connection there between the archaeological remains yeah. and this this uh, witness from record. Epiphanius. Yeah. Interesting. The, the, it, it seems as if in the fourth century, when Christianity took over the Roman Empire, and people were started to look for the holy right. places, that they they identified the house of Peter at Capernaum, the house of Peter at Bethsaida, the location of the fish uh, fish and laws miracle, and mm -hmm. so on. And immediately they built something around it. In the fifth, sixth century, when the country was full of churches, oh, yeah. they developed it into a much larger church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. Any other exciting updates from the site, new finds that you can share with us? The most important thing, uh, two things are important, of course. First of all, is the uh, ability to identify the fourth century structure. The, the, the town or the, the police of uh, the small police of uh, Julius Bethsaida was abandoned somewhere in the third century. Mm. I, I assume because of uh, uh, the level of the lake uh -huh. rising up and it was too wet to live there, it was abandoned. So it took another 100 years or so until the lake went down and people identified the place and started in the fourth century to create a sacred site there. Uh, but but we have also the the um, the uh, village or the city, it's a town itself, city, small city of uh, uh, Julius. We have uh, private dwellings. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. We, we have already some, uh, we discovered it in three different, four different areas that we excavated, but the large one today, what we call area D, yielded uh, five, six rooms <laughs> of a house. And it seems to me now that's only, we can say, the only beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That this is a, uh, not a very rich family, but not a poor family. Right. We discovered every last season uh, discovered a lot of objects that uh, are speaking about more uh, um, rich life, uh, such as um, 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 glass vessels, wow. okay. yeah. um, stone vessels. One of them is very made of very fine stone, typical to to, to the Jewish life. But this one is a fine stone. It, it makes takes more money to, to cut mm-hmm. this right. stone. And uh, um, what was very uh, surprising is a horde of coins. Yeah. Uh, it's not that this is a, a security horde, as we call it. Someone is in a time of war and they're hiding right. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But this was probably uh, in, in a box, on a shelf, mm. maybe in a small niche in the wall. And the house was abandoned. And they forgot to take they forget it. About the, they forgot about the <laughs> to save the deposit box. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mom said, uh, when they're flying away, Mom said, did you take the money? I said, oh, I forgot the money. <laughs> I forgot the money. <laughs> so when it all collapsed, all the coins, not no box, but there are all, a lot of coins. We have like uh, 70 coins, if I remember well, mm. around 70 coins. This is the second uh, hoard in, in Israel that has both um, uh, gold, silver and uh, um, bronze coins wow. together yeah um, and it, uh, it it's not yet being processed but we have coins from the first century from emperor nero of Vespasian. Hmm. it looks like to the very end of the second century maybe even beginning of the third we'll have to oh, learn really? it in the next few months wow. it's it is it is it is beautiful that the, the, the people who work there were so um, uh, excited, yeah, and that's what happened when you when you find horrid, and especially when you find gold. Yeah, yeah. For me, as an archaeologist, a bronze coin is good as yeah. a gold coin. Right, right. But we are human beings. We see yeah. gold, <laughs> <laughs> things go crazy. Yeah, things go crazy. So it was very, very uh, interesting. Also, we 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 found a, a small vessel, about a few inches, uh, a clay vessel, which we identify as a. Uh, Inkwell, oh really? And that's yeah. um, that's interesting. If I'm right, this and that if I get as an as an inkwell, because it means that this uh, at least this family, uh, which is a little bit more rich than mm-hmm. we used to, although we have there a lot of uh, um, fishing weights and they mm. were fishermen. Yeah, there was at least one person Good who right. knew how to write. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's important. Yeah, now, for a new. New Testament perspective, that's, that's important. Very important. Because yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in modern scholarship, sometimes you will hear scholars question whether Jesus' followers, because they, right. were, because they were fishermen, whether yeah. they were literate, right. whether they were capable actually to write down and record. And, and so there's a, there's a tendency uh-huh. to assume that they're yeah. all illiterate. Yeah. And, and I might say that there has been in the 20th century, there sometimes was a general assumption that the Galilee itself yeah, was, was illiterate, sort of a backwater. Right, right. So when you start finding things like this that cut against that assumption and mm-hmm. it makes you pause and, and rethink that. And, yeah. and it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't prove that Jesus' uh, apostles were, as followers were, literate, but it actually raises the very real possibility. Yeah. So and, Peter's name is not on the inkwell. Uh, yeah. Not yet. Not yet. No. Okay. <laughs> I love that. So Inkwell right next to fishing weights. Yes. Yeah. Amazing that's really cool. in this that's, site. That's yeah. a, it was an interesting surprise. Uh, um, it's also um, together with Inkwell, but also the other finds tells us that not everyone in the Galilee, as it reflected sometimes in the New Testament, not everyone were poor fishermen right. and poor peasants. Oh yeah, there were also rich yeah, people. Rich people, yeah. 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 Well, it's a city, right? And they have bathhouses. That's why. And, exactly. You know, of course, you exactly. have some some means. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because because when people are reading New Testament and sometimes even scholars, they say that Jesus appealed to the Galileans because they were all poor yeah, peasants. Poor, right. Right. Mm. He didn't go to Tiberias and Sepphoris because all the rich people were living there. Ah. Uh, 
It's not. Mm -hmm. There were Irish people living in the villages. Yeah. Right. Well. Yeah. So you were working, I know, when you know the war began in Israel, and you've continued working at the site since. What's that experience been like? Uh, uh, our group of volunteers arrived uh, October 6. Wow. Mm. Uh, October 7 morning, we were all in shock. Foreigners and locals. And... Uh, we were talking to them, and, and I said, that's, that's, that's horrific, but we can work here. It was not anywhere far away from the events. Uh, and I think that this is, uh, it could be some kind of escapism to continue doing the mm -hmm. work, doing the work that we believe in, doing work of peace. Yeah. And we we're supposed to have our uh, group of uh, local Arabs from the village of Sakhnin in the Galilee to join us and work. But Sunday they called me and said, we don't come. We will not come. Hmm. Try to imagine, he said to me, try to imagine 20 Arabs in a car driving in the roads of Galilee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure we will be able to arrive. Right. Not going to get right. very far. Right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, he said, we are afraid you won't come. I said, I understand you very well. We are working with them for a long time. So we worked only with our volunteers. I think that those who were working there were happy to work. They were not too concerned, but their families sure. were very concerned. So after four, three days, they decided to leave. So for the next uh, two days, we worked only the team. And uh, next Sunday, our Arab workers came to work. Hmm. Uh, I, I'm living in the Galilee for uh, 45 years. My neighbors are Muslims, Christians, Jews, side by side. On Saturday, our shops are closed. They are open. On Sunday, they are closed shop. We are open. Yeah. It's, it's mixed life. Living in Israel is living a uh, life which is mixed between all the, all the groups. And it's usually quiet and peaceful. And even this war, as people, uh, not not here in America, but they don't know enough. Mm -hmm. But in Israel, we are very happy that the local Israeli Arabs took the side. They realized that this is an awful event, mm -hmm. anti-Islamic at all, mm -hmm. and they they don't they don't go out uh, and, and protest, and they they are um, sharing the deep grief of mm -hmm. Israelis. As long as there were Muslims killed by the terrorists of Hamas. Yeah. Yeah. As a guy yeah. sitting in the car with his Quran trying to ex explain to them that, that he is a Muslim and they kill him. Right. So the local Arabs are really sharing uh, the problem with us. And I felt it very well to, while working with my friends, Arab friends, for three mm. weeks wow. in the field. Uh, and it was um, a very important human experience. Yeah. 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 It's great to hear that uh, work together, do positive things, uh, uh, model what how we should relate to each other. That's a it's a great privilege and opportunity. Yeah. I think I, you know as a foreigner coming in and being in the midst of that, and and I think so often the news tends to sort of yeah. make it as you know Jews and Arabs on Tuesday, mm -hmm. and they right. they miss the complexity of Israeli society. Uh, and the fact that, by and large, you have uh, coexist. I mean, you always have the odd person, but by and large, you have coexistence between right. Jews, mm -hmm. Arabs, Muslims, Christians, um, and and it's and it was reflected. Uh, and, and people who heard about it later were a bit shocked yeah. that, in the midst of all this going on in Gaza, which was a horrific situation, up here in a little pocket on the north north shore of the Sea of Galilee, here's this collection of, of Jews, Christians, Muslims, who are working together side mm -hmm. by side, yeah. uh, with no no animosity, no 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 suspicions, no uh, working together, and mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's a picture that too often doesn't get, doesn't get broadcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we're you know, and we people ask me if I I, I stayed on and worked, mm -hmm. and people ask me if I felt uncomfortable, unsafe. I said, no, not at all. It was where we were, as multi-dimensions, we were far removed from mm -hmm. from the situation. 
uh, in the South, and it uh, and it was it was a good experience. And I think when we talked about it, because initially we talked about should we continue, mm -hmm. and if I can say it, they they said we would prefer to dig, yeah, because otherwise we sit at home yeah. and just listen to the news. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They yeah. said I, being yeah. out here doing something and not so much an escape because you can't escape yeah, such right. a thing but at least not being uh, yeah, as constructive right. positive, and, yes. and, and uh, yeah. they said we would prefer actually to continue to dig because you know we talked about it. is it is it suitable to, right. to continue digging right and um, but it was a it was a it was an interesting experience and of course yeah. uh, it's not done yet and yeah. we're you know we get we're digging this summer yeah yeah actually want you to explain how people might be able to connect in with you guys yeah, the, uh, we the, the, we have a website, uh, elaraj, E-L-A-R-A-J, excavations.com. And that's usually our place where we put pictures, reports, a blog. I do a blog usually when we're there, yeah. just a general update. Uh, any lectures that we have uh, are linked there. So people can go and get a sort of overview of the last seven years of excavation. And it's also a place that talks about, gives the dates for our dig this year. We're digging the last last week of July, first week of August, mm -hmm. uh, two-week session, and then another two-week session, I think something like the 13th to 27th of September. People can go on there and, and find out details about volunteering, coming over and being a part of it. And of course, people have asked us the questions, are we going to dig? And my response is consistently, we are going to dig, period. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. If we're in another situation like we were in the autumn, where their volunteers can't come or don't feel comfortable, then we'll we'll use local labor. Mm -hmm. uh, we're committed in making an exerted effort, particularly over the next three years. Mm -hmm. So come what may, uh, we are we are digging. Period. So uh, and those who feel comfortable or interested uh, can can go on there, and then there are links to sort of explore the possibility of coming over. Uh, it's no experience is needed. It's mm -hmm. on the job training. Uh, I, I will say that July is hot. Hot. <laughs> uh, so it is. It is warm, but we dig. Yeah. We dig early in the morning from usually six to twelve. Hmm. So we dig in the cool of the morning. Mm -hmm. We can speak of cool of the morning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then we, you know, we break, and so we're we're digging when it's a bit cooler, and it's uh, and we have the whole age range we have everything yeah. from from you know teenagers to uh up you know 70s right uh people who are there and everybody does what they're able to do yeah and it's um there's something again there's something about touching history yeah that i think is really important and puts things in perspective uh again we have people digging who have deep faith we have people there who are digging more out of an interest in history yeah. and not not so much motivated by mm -hmm. uh, issues of faith. So it's a it's a wide it's a really interesting uh, collection of individuals that have been drawn there with sort of a common purpose. So it's um, yeah no we'll uh, if anybody's interested again elaragexcavations dot com and um, you can go there and if you have you know I think there's an email even. So if you have questions, you can write yeah. in. Well, you have the advantage of, I mean, every year you find, like, really cool stuff. Like, every year. Yeah, right? there's so clearly more to find. It's like if you find. want to be on a Super Bowl team, right? You go to L.R.I. This, this is the secret of archaeology. Yeah. Yes. You don't know what's under the yeah, ground. Yeah, exactly. You go there, you yeah. know nothing. And every day, that, that, I'm in archaeology since I was 14. Yeah. And I'm 70. And there is not a day similar to their last day. Hmm. Every day is different. Yeah. Yeah. But the, yeah. but you're right. This is a site that continues to surprise yeah, us every year and give. Yeah. And you're, you know, we just sort of say, okay, what's next year? It's, uh, yeah. you know, the, and it it it, it makes you excited about yeah. going back and, and and uncovering more of the city. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we'll look forward to having you back next year again for yes. for, the MA for 24. <laughs> um, your program tonight, we'll, uh, we'll record that. It'll be in our YouTube channel eventually yeah. and get updates there. And if I could put a commercial in, this is a kind of a big year for the museum in terms of archaeology and projects and 
And uh, in June, for example, your colleague, uh, Dr. Yeshu Dre, will be here to talk about oil lamps and even bring some kits for uh, ancient oil lamp production. A lot of fun there. I think that's June 16th. Yes, and, yes. Uh, Learn to make your, your own. your colleagues from the IAA will be here in June and in September. So lots going on this year. And, uh, and, and Saturday, too. Next Saturday, week. yes, it's this Saturday, this uh, Saturday. Uh, the oil lamps at Shaheen. Uh, uh, so Mati will be, actually, he's, yeah, two sites that he's on and two amazing sites, yes, uh, yes. both in the gallery, and we'll have updates there on Saturday. So lots going on. Uh, thanks for coming back again. Always great to be see happy. you. Thank you for yeah. having us. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for listening to Today at Museum of the Bible. Thank you for listening to today at Museum of the Bible. Join us again to hear how authors, scholars, and leaders are engaging with the Bible every day. Only on today at Museum of the Bible.